Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Wisdom Gym. So this is where we invite some of the world's best teachers and best facilitators to come and talk about their practices, share them with us, and also kind of help us understand why they're important in the world right now. And really excited today to have Jamie Bristow. So Jamie is the director of the Mindfulness Initiative. And it's a charity here in the UK, but also work globally, and probably most famous for teaching mindfulness to politicians around the world. And they've supported the introduction of mindfulness training in over 10 national parliaments. And they've also recently released a report uh, called Mindfulness Developing Agency in Urgent Times. And that was one that I really loved reading and I'm keen and looking forward to talking about it because it covers a lot of the themes we've been covering on the channel, looking at how mindfulness can help us with with our agency, both I think individually and collectively, but also our collective sense making, which is obviously a, a crucial topic right now in the world. And Jamie's also a respected mindfulness teacher in his own right. And so he's going to share some of his practice with us here today. But uh, Jamie, welcome to the Wisdom Gym. Thank you, really lovely to be here. I'm um, uh, an avid watcher of uh, Rebel Wisdom myself. So yeah, particular pleasure to be speaking to this, this group today. Oh, thanks, man. It's, yeah, it's good to have you here and um, been, been hoping to do this for a while. And I thought it might be a good place to start, Jamie, to just um, give a big picture. So I think a lot of people watching might associate mindfulness and mindfulness practice with something we, we do alone, or maybe we do it in a small group, but we certainly do it um, as, a, as a very sort of personal individual practice. That's, I think, um, uh, how it's come into the West in a lot of ways. Uh, you've been talking about the role it can play, uh, you know, transforming systems. So I'm particularly interested to hear from you. Yeah, what role do you think mindfulness can play in changing our institutions? Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ali. The first up, a, a clarification. Um, the organization that I run is a, is, is a policy institute, uh, a think tank. So we don't actually do uh, most of the teaching of, of parliamentarians. It's the Oxford University Mindfulness Centre that's been doing most of it in the British Parliament since 2013. Um, and since then, almost 300 MPs and members of the House of Lords have been on a on a mindfulness course. And actually, so, so since the, its very inception, the Mindfulness Initiative has been uh, most concerned with mindfulness in society. And that, that includes uh, helping politicians uh, to think about how this could be applied in healthcare, schools, um, prisons. Uh, but, but, but what's been driving me personally and the organization is this sort of societal lens, how this can, how this can help at a group level and lead to, to flourishing societies. Uh, you know, um, some of the politicians I work with are interested in how it could be helpful for improving the kind of quality of democracy, both in terms of how citizens interact with, um, with the state and how politicians interact with, with each other. So uh, we, we, you know, we started off this inquiry helping them to form a, 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 an all-party parliamentary group on mindfulness. And, uh, and we do a policy inquiry, looking at where the evidence is strongest. Um, and that is healthcare. That's where a lot of, you know, over the last 40 years, a lot of the evidence base is, has been developed. Uh, and, and as a result, perhaps, the perception of mindfulness in society has a kind of clinical or a well-being um, sort of flavor to it. This is where it's taken off most and, and, and perhaps why most people will, 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 will get into it. But over yeah, the last six or seven years, we've, we've developed uh, the understanding and developed a case for why mindfulness isn't, isn't just a, a nice to have well-being benefit, but is instead a foundational capacity. So we talk about it as being a kind of natural human a natural human capacity. Like we all are somewhat mindful some of the time, even if you've never heard of the word. And you can you can choose if you want to on purpose to cultivate this capacity. And it just so happens that this is uh, really fundamental for um, for being able to perceive the world more clearly and more accurately, making sense of the world, uh, making uh, sort of clearer decisions and acting together more um, 
collaboratively and creatively. And the document that, that, that Ali's mentioned there pulls together that evidence into a framework that kind of um, shows, shows why that's the case. It might be good to actually define what mindfulness is because yeah. I think a lot of us have, you know, we talked about this before the session, you know, a lot of us have different definitions. And particularly once we start talking about it uh, more broadly and, and the way it can actually change institutions, change society, I think it becomes even more important. So, so what, what's your definition of mindfulness? The definition that we use is of a, a natural human capacity which is the ability to attend to the here and now, to what's going on in and around us with particular attitudes of uh, openness, curiosity, and care. So there's this kind of uh, the intention to pay attention. There's a kind of attention training element, having a handle on your own mind, knowing where it is and being able to move it um, flexibly and, and dexterously. And there's also the quality of awareness, which is really critical. It isn't just attention training, this openness, curiosity, and care, make it not value neutral and underpin all the um, many of the anyway, therapeutic benefits and benefits to say, you know, um, seeing the world more clearly, that kind of openness and curiosity, um, counteracts our tendencies for confirmation bias and, um and, and and such and jamie what have you noticed actually going into uh you know uh, or at least or even supporting people going into parliaments around the world and, and helping politicians to become more mindful you know what what hap what what do you expect to see and then what what do you see once a say a group of politicians has done a, a pro- is it an eight-week mindfulness course that they yeah. do is it? yeah it's an eight, eight-week mindfulness course and they've They've uh, more recently started doing kind of silent practice days where like on a cross party basis, people taking a Sunday out to go and uh, meditate together and do mindful speaking and listening and, and really uh, reporting some some profound uh, shifts. So in most people join one of these courses um, because they have some kind of self-regulation um, need. Uh, and, and, and the intentions, you've got to sort of start where people are. I mean, I, I started practicing 20 years ago because I wanted to concentrate for longer. You know, I, I wanted to sit at my desk um, uh, for longer and, and uh, uh, yeah, regulate my attention. But very soon, that kind of intention changes to self, from self-regulation to self-exploration. And then you start to kind of see with this greater receptivity and awareness that, that um, yeah, you, you you are. There's more to yourself and to um, and to the world around you than, than 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 perhaps you saw before. And then often the the intention changes from that to um, self transcendence. It's uh, it, 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 it's called. So you're practicing not just for the benefit your own benefit, but for the benefit of others. Actually, Sean, short, I'm, I'm quoting directly there. Shauna Shapiro's classic classic study from from yeah the 20 years ago. Or so. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, and I'm immediately curious, just imagining these politicians going, uh, you know, being in a class together or even choosing to spend a Sunday together. You know, I know that you've done, it's obviously not just politicians from one party who are meditating, they're, they're cross party. Does it have an effect on the, um, the polarization we see politically and, and the fact that they are effectively, um, uh, you know, political uh opponents you know is there is there any change in that any shift yeah well to kind of answer answer your previous question around you know what benefits um have have they seen like personally they've talked about how mindfulness has helped them with public speaking like there's one there's one conservative politician a former uh government minister in the uk who who when she was a, a backbencher um, used to take her shoes off in the chamber to do kind of like this grounding mindfulness practice to like bring her attention down into her feet because um, curiously your you know your feet are rarely nervous the, you know nervousness and anxiety is often up here but, but having that flexibility of awareness bring it down there bring your attention into the, the lower part of your body she found really profound to, to help her sort of yeah open up and speak properly and then when she got made a government minister and she was on the front bench the, the tv cameras would have picked up the her kicking off her shoes so her colleagues like banned her from doing that but um, other people have mentioned how there's a kind of um, the, the allowing and forgiveness quality helps you to kind of move on from a, maybe a TV interview that didn't go quite so well. 
Um, and uh, then some of the words that they often report back from having done these courses that it helps them with perspective, like keeping things in perspective, um, not getting caught up in the pressure and keeping your um, keeping view of what's important and seeing things from different perspectives. And that leads into um, some of the, um, yeah, the first few years, we heard from politicians saying that, you know, this was helpful for me, feeling better, um, better mental health and, and well-being and more effective in my job. And then in the last few years, they've started to become more and more visionary in what, how they've, um, in how they think mindfulness helps them with the particular activity of politics. And so one can, uh, again, a conservative politician saying mindfulness helps me to disagree better because there's an affinity amongst people who've been on this mindfulness course. It's a connection at the level of the shared humanity rather than just the ide ideologies has helped them to have a kind of um, more considered approach to exchanges of differing views in, in, in their words. Um, other politicians have said that um, uh, the kind of open, open minded seeking after better understanding um, uh, that, that, that mindfulness inculcates helps the, helps the process. And there is starting to be some empirical evidence as well that mindfulness reduces polarization uh, and, and, and increases a, a des, um, like conflict re resolution and a, de and a desire for, for, for some mutually beneficial outcomes. And so what, what started off as kind of, yeah, visionary statements and, and, and rhetoric is starting to now be backed up by, by, by the evidence. Yeah, that's, that's really heartening to hear, I, I think, um, uh, certainly for me. And because, you know, we've talked about this on the channel a lot, you know, the, the science and psychology of polarization, like what are the capacities we need? Um, and I'm a you know, very big advocate of, of mindfulness and in, in particular the self-compassion, but also decentering the ability to take a step mm -hmm. back from the content of our experience. And another thing that we've been on an inquiry around uh, really since the beginning is the relationship between shifting our inner states, everything you were just describing, you know, learning, um, learning those capacities that allow us to, I think what you said, open-minded seeking for better understanding is, is an absolutely wonderful phrase, um, sums it up really nicely. So how, how do these inner states relate to actually changing the systems around us, changing institutions, changing the way we do things? I'd be really curious to hear, um, yeah, your thoughts on that. Yeah. So what what we're what we're seeing what, what, the critique we often get or the question we often get is is um, so if all these politicians are doing personal mindfulness practice, what <laughs> why is it why does it still look so so bad from the outside, right? Um, well, 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 first of all, most of those who are really committed to it are, are backbenchers. They're, they're, they're not the ones. There there are a few ministers, but they're not the ones you see on TV yet, anyway. Um, and uh, uh, but the other thing is that we we are starting to sense that there is a limit to what personal mindfulness practice can do, and that that you are kind of limited by the culture that you that you're in, uh, and that actually the the mindfulness which particularly considers the social context and is and is practiced and developed in teams. Is is probably a lot more transformative. So so for, so first of all, um, we need to we need innovations and we need developments that take mindfulness training from an individual lens to a to a, to a more social lens. And those developments are happening. And so, and and, and uh, like, again, some are, are developing an evidence base. So that's kind of a caveat to start. So if we look at a kind of mindfulness and compassion. Broadly, you know, developing the mind and heart in in the round, and the and and the evidence from you know eight thousand plus papers on on mindfulness al alone, um, you you can make a um, a, a pretty strong case as we do in the mindfulness developing agency in urgent times document, um, that these are uh, these are what are required to make us equal to the challenges of our times, like as 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 has been featured you know in, in great detail on 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 your channel um we are currently deeply struggling to um to to to, to make sense and and collaborate and so uh there is you know the level of the individual nodes within a network like 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 um the the the, the 
the conditions or the, the the capacities of those individual nodes will condition what the what emergent phenomena can arise from 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 the network. So so these things aren't separate, you know, the individual and the, and, and and the collective. Um, that uh, we need to work at, at at both levels. And if if we were all uh, leveling up, to use um, you know the computer game an, a, analogy, um, uh, who knows what kind of um, what different emergent patterns might, might might evolve from from the from the neural net of uh, of our societies? I'm curious what you would do if you had unlimited funds to develop uh, you know mindfulness initiatives in different areas of society. Um, just complete blue sky thinking. Where where would you put the most effort, or or different areas you would put the most effort into? Mm. Uh, well, first of all, the you know the, the evidence is really strong enough in a, a number of areas for us to just make it broadly available for the whole population. And there are there are various systemic sort of biases towards say uh, antidepressant and opiate medication rather than making it available for pain and depression, where it's as effective and has a halo effect that just makes your life better rather than giving you lots of horrible side effects. So there are there are millions of people around the world that benefit like tomorrow. Um, uh, more broadly, yeah, I think there's um, uh, empowering these uh, innovations, developing the evidence base over pretty short period of time you could probably do it in two or three years and then roll out a population level um uh, capacity building programs which um uh, could ha have dramatic impact on climate responsiveness on um political polarization uh and re you know, resistance to um yeah the uh, polluted information ecology, uh, and, and and some of the, some of the ideas there. Um, one of the innovations that I'm in, involved with, being sort of partly sponsored by the European Commission, is developing a kind of climate leaders program, which is uh, which is also the subject of our next piece of work, looking at responsiveness and resilience to to, to, to the climate crisis. So, mm. um, before before we um, open up to to questions, Jamie, it would be good to hear a little bit more about. Um, the the paper um, that we were just talking about um, that uh, the developing agency in urgent times because uh, yeah I'd, I'd especially love to delve in a little bit to the role that that mindfulness plays in developing agency because that's something we've talked about in the channel but and also developing our, I suppose our collective agency rather than just mm -hmm. as individuals yeah so so that document really tries to to um interweave the individual and collective nature uh, of addressing the great challenges of our times. Inspired by the work of uh, Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger in their, in their, in their sovereignty, sovereignty model, um, that actually uh, mindfulness uh, is, even in its sort of clinical applications, most uh, fundamentally about conscious action. And that's conscious action internally as well as externally. So it's it's being able to step out of repetitive thought um, patterns that drag us down into depressive relapse, for instance, in a clinical context. Or it is um, uh, helping us to step out of addictive behaviours like the smoking applications. Uh, you know, um, and uh, we have... And there are lots of sort of vision, visionary statements from the likes of John Kabat-Zinn and others saying, you know, mindfulness will help us to... Um, trigger a global renaissance in in, uh, in in society, and others have said you know, similarly visionary things that I'm definitely down with, but that are somewhat kind of like cut off or or others. You know, th th there's a gulf between those statements and what the evidence base says, because <clears throat> the evidence base is restricted about how evidence is made. Like it's so siloed, like academics are so specialised in this very very narrow area, and policymakers are too. They don't think about the implications of what they're doing for often for like health or prisons or all these other areas. They're just interested in secondary schools or primary schools, you know, because that's their, their remit. Um, and so we've done the job in this document, essentially, of developing the sovereign sovereignty model uh, into what we call yeah, an agency model, looking at the domains of perception, understanding and, and, and action. And then we take the evidence base and, and meticulously uh, uh, sort of thre thread it through. So in, in perception, the key areas that this 
would help all of us is in regulating the attention and particularly defending against the attention economy and forces that would uh, distract and hijack and sell your your attention. It, it, it won't do this alone, but um, uh, it, it could be the critical difference that enables you to get other protocols in, pr- in place for that kind of psychic self-defense that's now necessary. Um, it helps uh, helps to kind of not just uh, uh, get a handle on our minds and regulate the attention, but to r- widen the bandwidth of perception. So this allowing an open quality. Um, some people go as far as defining mindfulness in these terms, that actually it's about seeing novelty. And, and in, 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 in the context of, yeah, like I said before, confirmation bias uh, and uh, this um, sort of entrenched views and, and, and the slowness at which we are responding to a, change, to, a, to a rapidly changing society and planet, this has uh, profound implications. And allowing things to be as they are is, is sometimes like um, uh, un- misunderstood and, 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 criti- and used to criticize mindfulness. It's not like a value system. Like, you know, we shouldn't allow things to be as they are forever and just be sort of calm as Hindu cows, to borrow the phrase from, uh, from Fight Club. Um, as we sort of you know crash towards extinction, but allowing things to be as they currently are is a prerequisite to um, to acting upon them and changing them for the better. Like if we are in denial or we have some, we're putting ideas of how things should be onto onto the world rather than seeing things as they are, then we aren't got, we're, got, we're not going to be able to act as skillfully as we might. And finally, the kind of well-being and, and, and stress benefits have, an, have implications for perception and understanding as well, because it, people, um, researchers have found that chronic stress that many of us are living under undermines our working memory, so we can actually hold less in mind to be able to process complex ideas, and it actually narrows the attentional field, not uh, uh, literally in terms of like researchers have found we don't look to the peripheries when we're chronically stressed. But metaphorically, we don't see the ideas, we get tunnel vision, we lock down over you know, around what we think um, things are like. So yeah, mindfulness could help us to, 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 to really perceive things uh, more clearly and more skillfully. And then in what we call making sense and making decisions, the second chapter, we look at the work of Ian McGilchrist um, and this sort of like integrating modes of mind, the, the verbal conceptual mode of mind, which is you know, very, very helpful. Seeing the world in its parts is, is very important, but um, uh, perhaps not quite as important as seeing, seeing the world in the, in the whole, in the round. And uh, cognitive scientists think that mindfulness helps us to do that, to, to reintegrate or to rebalance our minds so that we can have a more holistic um, uh, sense-making ability. And a lot of the mindfulness em- applications, there are a lot of mindfulness applications which really uh, major on the element of, particularly through embodiment and tuning into the body, being clearer on what our values are, what's important, and living more in line with that more of the time. And, uh, and, and you know, according to the Boston Consulting Group, mindfulness seems to help collective intelligence as well. So there's this collective uh, um, uh, implication of uh, innocent sense-making domain. And then finally, in the, you know, I've, I've touched upon um, some, of these, uh, some of these areas for action, but there's particularly the responding, not reacting, so this is to act creatively and consciously rather than blindly out through impulse and habit. This is one of the top three things, as well as perspective and respect, um, that politicians report. They keep saying, helps me to respond, not react. And I'll finish by just um, going back to education. You know, the, the founder of um, uh, Amer- American psychology, uh, William James, um, in, in, the, in the 19th century, said that like uh, the, uh, the education par excellence is uh, the training of attention, like bringing the wandering mind back, back again and again and being able to, um, to attend to what you want to attend to. Because it kind of this faculty of attention renders our world for us. Um, it, it binds up all the other faculties of, 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 of conscious experience and cognition. And if we're not under control, in control of it, then somebody, somebody else may, may well be in a shaping our world for us. And he said, like, you know, whatever it was 200 years ago, it's easier to define this ideal than to bring it about. And, and, and unfortunately, yeah, we, 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 were, we were ignorant at the time. On the other side of the planet, in the East, they were very, very clear on, on, on how you could 
regulate the attention and, and, and make that an education par excellence. And, and now we're starting to integrate the best of the West and the best of the East with the, with the science of mindfulness. Wonderful, Jamie, thank you for that. So um, I wanna leave us enough time to um, have, have a Q&A and have a kind of uh, group discussion. So um, Jamie, I, I wondered if you're, if you're still open to leading us through a, a meditation before we go into some, some uh, breakouts uh, sure. to, to kind of inquire a little bit before the Q&A. Sure, well, I mentioned the work of Ian McGilchrist and this sort of uh, shifting of modes or balancing modes of mind. And it can be, be really helpful um, to be aware of when we're really in the verbal conceptual and we've forgotten our bodies and we've forgotten the kind of sensing intuitive mode of mind, which are, which are linked, that kind of embodiment, the sensing of awareness, the fitting everything into a bigger picture. So to, to regularly, you know, when we're in these really buzzy, exciting conversations, to regularly bring ourselves back to and listen to the, to the, to the, to the body as well as to what's being, to, being said can be enormously helpful. So I'll just offer you know, instruction to do that um, in, somewhat informally. So if we could just sit here in our chairs or you know, whatever posture we're in and just bring the body to mind. Because where's, where's the body been? Has it been part of your awareness over the last 40 minutes? Like, what is, it, what is it telling you if you check into it? Perhaps there's the kind of like resonant pattern of um, emotions playing based on you know, what, what's been heard or said. Maybe there's excitement, maybe there's frustration. Maybe there's discomfort. Maybe there's pleasant feeling. But just for a moment, wherever it feels appropriate to you, Feeling body now, breathing. And it can be helpful, not for everybody, but for many people to use the breath as an anchor of the awareness. You can close your eyes if you wish, or have a soft gaze as you turn attention inwards to the rising and falling, expanding and contracting of the breath. If for any, any reason the breath's not a great thing for you to attend to at this moment, then bring it down to your feet, down to your legs, or the feeling of your bum on the chair. What we've just done is just sort of acknowledged what's going on here right now. And we want to move from acknowledging, allowing, to gathering. So sort of steadying the mind on the breath or on the, on the feet. And as thoughts arise, as they will, You get distracted from this everyday sensation of the body breathing. Just gently pick it up and bring it back. And that, that act of picking it up and bringing it back is the work. You haven't messed up by wandering off. It's not about stopping thoughts. It's about the kindness, the softness, but the firmness that you bring the mind back with. Practicing those qualities. You might have to do it a hundred times, a thousand times in a practice. Sometimes very few. It's like training a puppy. You don't kick the puppy or shout at it, you just Pick it up and put it back where it should be. Positive reinforcement. And you could do this practice and gather the awareness for as long as you want. Two minutes, three minutes, 30 minutes, an hour.
But today we're going to move to the final phase. When you're ready, we're going to expand the awareness from the body or the feet. We're going to kind of widen the beam of awareness like a torchlight, torch beam widening slowly, taking in more and more of the body until once again we have as much of the body and awareness as, as, it, as is possible to us. And if your eyes are closed, starting to open them, perhaps wiggling fingers or with this, having checked in with the body now, this sensitivity, perhaps stretching or doing what you, what you most need in order to listen for another or to talk for another 45 minutes. Sometimes it can be surprising how much you just really need to move the shoulders. <sighs> So what I just um, introduced there was a, a classic model, sometimes described as an hourglass, or remembered with the uh, acronym AGE, age. So we acknowledge and allow what's currently going on, whatever's going on. We gather the awareness into some narrower part of the awareness, the body or the breath, and then we expand it out again uh, into the day. So that can be done in just three minutes if you... If you, if you remember that model. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you, Jamie, for taking us through that. Um, and I know there were some good questions in the chat for Jamie. And Claudia, you have one in the chat uh, around McMindfulness, which is, um, uh, I think, a, a really good question. So I wondered if you wanted to uh, ask that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ali. Um, yeah, I was. I remember when the mindfulness book came out, and I was really disappointed because I'm completely sold on the idea of mindfulness as being, a, you know, something that could be potentially transformative in, in in the world, and to really change people's minds and and think more more carefully about about you know how the world is moving. And it, it, it was basically a critique of of mindfulness or mindfulness, how it was kind of co opted a little bit by the capitalist system to kind of get the worker bees to be more productive, like a sort of, you know, executive stress ball. I think I've even heard it sort of mentioned. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that critique um, and whether you do, you know, because, you know, and how, how would you counter that? Because like, like you, I do think it could be transformative, but can it be kind of weaponized in a sense by, by the, the, the capitalist system in, in a certain way? Yeah, great, great question. I, I, you know, I think it, um, I think there are ways we really got to watch out. I think the critique itself wasn't made in particularly good faith, I have to say, because by the time the book came out, Ron Purser had been engaging with people in the mindfulness field for many years, and he was sort of disabused of many of his misunderstandings and just plain like half truths and, and, and falsities but there's a kind of like momentum of critique and that he was getting a lot of oxygen and, and profile for, for making those critique it's actually the critique is cut very deep particularly in the uk um because it got serialized in the in the guardian um and so it has implications that we're not we're, we're not yet healing and uh, repairing fully but on the other hand the critiques actually spurred the mindfulness world to res to respond and to make it much more explicit that uh, this has social implications and, and I'm making the kind of the, the ethics of it much, much clearer. So you know, on balance, it might end up being a good thing that kind of the dialectic uh, of, of, of critique and counter critique is, um, is, is healthy to an extent, but you know, um, uh, it is shallow. Um, it is perhaps fairer, is a fairer critique for, for, for Northern California than it is for Europe and other parts of the US, where actually there's a kind of hyper um, commercialized version of it where people are being uh, mindfulness mentors or consultants or coaches or, you know, and, and 
often these numbers are mentioned about how much money is being made in the mindfulness industry and it's X number of billion, which as far as I can tell is pretty much all the apps. I mean, like it, it's, a, it's a labor of love. It's very hard to make a living from almost everywhere. And people are, you know, people say that mindfulness is, is caught and not taught. That actually you get the bug, you kind of think, oh, this is really profound. I want to share it with people. And you're kind of, you know, you, you kind of demonstrate it. And, 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 uh, and, and I, I know I've worked across um, defense and armed forces, policing, uh, you know, prisons, hospitals, schools, uh, lawyers, global banks, you know, global tech firms, almost universally. This is a bottom up thing where people are just desperate for wanting to share it with, with others and sometimes actually staying in places in order to help their colleagues and to change the culture from within when they've woken up and realized this is a, this is a difficult place to be. I, I'd rather leave, but actually I can't leave my colleagues. You know, I've got to help them by bringing this mindfulness thing in, you know, before I do. Um, and actually mindfulness, it seems to, in many cases, lead to higher staff turnover where toxic conditions haven't been addressed. And there's evidence recently that if you want your unhappy workforce to keep on working, even though the job makes them unhappy, don't teach them mindfulness. Because if they're like working in a call center or something, and actually they have to fake being happy and they're not, they're not actually very happy, mindfulness is counterproductive. So, like the evidence is pointing towards, you know, the, that critique not being not being right. I and there's also something, even if it was right, it's really it's really kind of a Marxist or a kind of um, uh, critical theory system first systems of oppression is the most real and important way to understand society type of lens that doesn't have the nuance of a both and. Like it's either or, it's like either we develop ourselves or we address the systems. And then there's a kind of like thing where it's opium for the masses. What we need people to be is more angry, more upset, more unwell, so that they'll go out on the street and they'll, you know, and they'll demand systems change. Well, that, how that's, how's that working for you? Because people are going to numb themselves with Netflix or opiates or, you know, real opiates. You know, if mindfulness is no opiate for the masses, what's, uh, what's oxycotin? Um, so, uh, so yeah. It's it's both and, um, and it and it's not a great critique. Critique. I put all these comments in um, my response, which did very well in terms of sort of shares, um, which I put in the chat now, and maybe we could um, circulate later. Yeah, brilliant. Great, great question. Great answer. Thank you both. Um, uh, Justin, you've got a good question in the chat as well. Yeah. Thanks, um, Jamie. What's the difference, as you see it anyway, between mindfulness and meditation? I mean, I, I lived in an ashram for a year in the mid seventies and I didn't hear the word mindfulness till maybe 20 years ago, but I've, and they seem distinct to me. One yeah. seems like letting go of everything and mindfulness appears to be more being attentive while you're engaged. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like they would work well together, but I've heard the term mindfulness meditation, which has sort of confused me. So I just like to hear what you think about that. Yeah, thanks. Great, great question, Justin. And I, and I wish I'd um, covered that in in the, in the introduction. So, and a lot of this confusion comes from the fact that, that, that the word mindfulness is used in so many different ways. Okay. So, so it's like I, I mapped it once. There was like ten different, I think, um, you know, verbs, nouns, all this different. You know, uh, the way we use it is that mindfulness is a natural psychological capacity that's been with us for God, you know, who, who knows how many sort of thousands of years, mostly kind of so undeveloped, you can't really notice it um, perhaps, but like you can really um, cultivate it. You do that through various mindfulness practices. And the, another word for mindfulness practice is meditation. Okay. So meditation is like, you could say it, meditation is like going to the gym and there are thousands of machines, there are yoga classes, there's the pool, there's all these different things you can do. And mindfulness meditation is like one set of, you know, one type of. Okay, so it's a piece of it. Yeah, it's like, well, actually, the, the word for meditation, which isn't actually a great translation of the Eastern Eastern traditions, but but a better one is is cultivation, bhavana, to 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 cultivate a certain part of your interiority. That's all it is. What do you want to cultivate today? I want to cultivate compassion. I want to cultivate mindfulness. I want to cultivate single pointed collected unification of mind which isn't mindfulness or compassion that's a different type of awareness and, that, and, and in, in, in sort of vedic meditation 
where you're using a mantra or you're really trying to get really, really focused to develop kind of like extra and ordinary states, that's quite different from mindfulness meditation. It's almost, yeah. You know, well, cultivation different. sounds like you're it's additive, or at least the way I was taught meditation, it's subtractive. You're stepping out rather than adding in. Uh, again, that's like that's like going to a Pilates class rather than going to a yoga class. Like, like, like it's it's um, the the act of meditation is so different in all these different traditions, and they come with different cosmologies, different frameworks for understanding what you're doing, different model of what the mind is, why you'd want to do meditation in the first place, how you do it, and what the outcome should be. All true. Yeah. So, so in the same way that, and that you know, the outcomes, the framework, the language is all different in a Pilates class compared to like weightlifting and wanting to get huge, you know, and that, that's that's why I'm using that analogy, I guess. Okay, and that, and that, that, yes, that, that there's some very profound meditation that is about subtraction. It is about quieting the mind, quieting the fabricating of the world so that so less and less and less happens. So you can see see more clearly and get, feel more peace and feel less distress. Well, there was a part of that in what you had us go through, of the stepping back from your thoughts, stepping back from your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is we're in a, in in the West. We're at the very beginning of understanding this stuff and having the language to be able to have these kind of, these kind of conversations. I don't um, ever to understand it, but I'm still playing with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 so so yeah. I, what I'm sensing is that mindfulness has done a great job at the vanguard of all of this. But essentially, you know, I mentioned it being an umbrella term. It's kind of creaking under the, un, under the job that it's doing, containing all these different sort of sub constructs. And actually, what we need to do is for it to kind of break apart a little bit, and for us to have conversations about the ethical component, have, about the compassion, about the the, the metacognition or whatever, about. Um, about the bit that's about quietening and stepping out and the bit that's more about stepping in and being closer. Like these are all aspects of it. But again, the, the public understanding is like, oh yeah, mindfulness is about chilling out and stopping your thoughts, right? And, that, and that's as far as it goes. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Those people. Very useful. Awesome. Um, so Gabriella, you have a, a question in the chat as well. Oh yeah. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much. Um, so, I actually, uh, I'm a big fan of mindfulness. Uh, I think that it can be really helpful. I was just wondering, uh, like when it comes to the expectations of mindfulness in politics, uh, because, you know, it, it's, mindfulness comes from Eastern traditions. Uh, so, you know, I, I wonder like, why Eastern societies are not more enlightened and perfect, you know, it's like you would expect something those lines, right? Yeah, um, I mean, I, what's really interesting is that mindfulness is going back to the East via the West. So I've, I've been invited to the Sri Lankan parliament, I've met Sri Lankan politicians and talked to them about how they feel about their own culture and, and the role of meditation in, in Sri Lankan society. And they're taking the innovation that went through kind of like Burma and Sri Lanka and particular innovation that happened at the beginning of 20th, 20th century, which led to, you know, eventually the kind of innovations in, in, in the clinical world in the 70s and 80s. And, and then, you know, eventually where we are now. And those innovations that we did over here are going back over there and being used in schools and in, and, and in, and in, 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 in politics. Because... Uh, and I can only really speak with some knowledge of the Sri Lankan context and, and to some extent the Thai context, but actually meditation isn't very common. Hmm. Buddhism's common and ritual's common and gratitude and, da and dana or giving, generosity. Some of the other practices in the Buddhist sort of approach are common, but, the, but meditation's often seen as something that monks do. And even then only some monks, many monks don't really do much of it at all. And, and, and a lot of them see enlightenment actually as something very, like, some people haven't been enlightened. I mean, some people think enlightenment hasn't happened for hundreds of years. Uh, and, it, and it's all very esoteric and, and separated from everyday life. But mm -hmm. now we're starting to, you know, in, in, in my understanding, you know, I know some very highly realized and you might say enlightened individuals. Um, uh, and and there, there are ways in which, yeah, I, th I think the... The global phenomenon, the meeting of Buddhisms and science, and the secularization of, 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 the, of these techniques, is is good for the for, for everybody in, the, in in a kind of modern globalized world. 
And Jamie, just just in like the last two minutes, um, is there anything you just wanted to to add uh, uh, that we didn't get to cover? Or any any kind of final closing words? Yeah, mindfulness might might be a universal human capacity, but the practices and the training aren't right for all people at all times. Having said that. Uh, we should all be thinking about what we're practicing because we should be practicing something. We should be wanting to bring something into our lives. And uh, that could be a heart quality, a mind quality, a relational quality. And we're, you know, like I say, mindfulness is kind of at the vanguard of uh, um, getting a handle on who we are and who we could be so i just yes just leave that thought that everyone everyone should have a practice and it's great that you know that there there are communities of practice like this one because we need to do it together you know our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down we're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods increasingly blind Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.